Have you ever wondered what an economist does? We are going to be speaking with Michael Austin, an economist, on this episode of Coffee with Chuck. Welcome back. This is an exciting day because of two reasons. One, our guest, Michael Austin, is an economist, and we want to kind of dive into what that means, why he decided he wanted to do that, a little bit about uh, growing up. He uh, attended Topeka High School, but also uh, wanted to talk about some other things that that have happened. So, um, Oh, the the other reason this is special is because we're actually doing a Facebook Live on Michael's Facebook page right now. And we'll talk about uh, why we're doing that because of some things that he's doing currently uh, in his life. So, Michael, welcome, first and foremost. Well, thank you very much, Chuck. I I have to admit, I feel a little awkward here. Um, I don't have a coffee. Uh, I don't have a cup of coffee. So um, I am drinking with you in spirit. (laughs) Okay. Um, I hope that's okay. (laughs) It is fine. I try to pass it to you virtually, but it just doesn't work for some reason. You hear about economists and there are jokes about economists sometimes, Michael. I, I don't know if you've heard any of those, but I'm really interested in why you wanted to become an economist and what kind of um, what you had to do and then what an economist does. But, but can we go back a little bit further and just tell us a little bit about yourself growing up, uh, kind of your story, and then how you got to where you are now. And then let's talk about some of the things you're trying to do in the future. Sure. Okay. So that's a big question. Um, (laughs) So we'll start off with, uh, um, where I came from. So uh, I'm originally from New York, um, uh, born in New York, born in Brooklyn, New York City. And, um, y- you know, my family uh, or our, my family, for the most part, are actually immigrants. We came to America, I think, in the mid to late 50s. Um, and we came from, you know, uh, Caribbean and the Central America, as well as England. And going, uh, living in New York City, my parents always told me, you know, your only job is to go to school and and, and get good grades, right? And um, so, of course, I did my darndest. And uh, uh, New York is really interesting. It has a unique opportunity where if you can test well, if you're a gifted student, you can go to almost any school in the city. Um, uh, definitely outside of, you know, whatever your residential area. So I went to gifted programs in elementary school and then to junior high school. And then I tried to get into, um, the high school was called Brooklyn Tech. Uh, it was, it's one of the most prestigious high schools in New York city, like top three in the city. Um, um, and you know, definitely one of the top schools nationwide and, uh, lo and behold, I didn't get in. Um, uh, and so I had to go to the school in my, in my residential area and that school was called South Shore High School. But the thing about South Shore was that it, uh, it had a constant gang presence. I think I, I vividly remember, um, looking at the school and, and knowing that in the year prior, it was like busted for drugs, you know, four times. And it had a constant gang presence, constant police presence. And um, it was my mother's worst nightmare to go to that school. So um, lo and behold, we had an opportunity. I, I really do think it was Providence. Um, uh, we had um, uh, an individual who worked at Hills Pet Nutrition and got a uh, promotion to work at the parent company of Hills, uh, which was Colgate Palmolive. But this job was in Ireland and he didn't want to sell his house. Um, So he called my mother and he said, why don't you and the kids come down to Kansas um, and you can have a whole new start to life. Michael can go to the high school here. Um, Your daughter, my sister um, can also start fresh. um, And, you know, the house is already paid for, just pay for the utilities and and anything extra. um, And then after five years, we'll reassess. So we, uh, so my mother sold everything. Um, everything that she owned except for the clothes in our closets just so that we can afford the move, which is always funny because I've always wondered as a kid how we were able to fit everything into one minivan. 
<laughs> um, and, and, and I guess now I know. Um, and so we came down to, we came down to Topeka. I went to Topeka high school. Um, and, and that's kind of it. The story kind of wrote itself. Um, so once at Topeka high school, I did debate all four years. And then after I graduated, um, I went back to Topeka high school and I coached debate um, and public speaking for another three years. Um, at the same time, I was also an avid tutor. I don't know whether you've heard of that, Chuck. It's, it's somewhat similar um, to the mentorship program you're working with. Um, and uh, I did that at the same time. Uh, uh, I also went to Washburn as I coached and, and, and tutored, and I uh, got my undergrad in economics. So before I keep going, do you have any other thoughts or questions? No, that that's great. So when you moved from New York, were you at the high school age then? So you went immediately to T high or did you, is that the age range you were around yeah, freshman or? It, it, it really worked out. I had just graduated junior high school. So okay. um, as I was about to graduate junior high school, I tested to get into Brooklyn tech, didn't make it. And so I had to go to South shore. So in that summer we left to come to yeah, Kansas. Okay. 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 Wow. It did work out just perfectly. Yeah, it did. Yeah. yeah. So at what point you said you studied, studied economics at Washburn, at what point did, would, did you start to get interested in economics and, and why, what was it that kind of sparked that interest? Um, that's a good question. You know, when I, when I started, I thought I was going to be an attorney. Um, I thought I was going to go into law uh, with that debate background. And then, you know, my freshman year at Washburn, I did some, um, I did another uh, uh, speaking competitive event. It was called mock trial. Um, and that's something that, you know, attorneys usually do when they want to start down that path. But it really started because um, I was at the business school and I took economics courses and I was just good at it. Um, and it's, it's, it's as relatively straightforward as that, you know, don't, don't, when, when you're going to school, don't, don't try to learn something that's really difficult for you. You know, this is where you're supposed to find your vocation, where you're supposed to find your career. And if you're good at something and it relatively pays well, that's the path you should follow. Um, and that's what it was for me in terms of economics. Um, uh, and it's a reason why I'm not an accountant because accounting was my worst subject. Um, and so I made sure I stayed away from that. Um, and so in doing economics, that was really easy for me at, at Washburn. Um, and so I graduated with that uh, Bachelor of Business Administration in economics. Um, but I'll tell you this, um, going to graduate school in economics was completely different. Um, one of the things I had to learn was uh, nothing negative about Washburn, but because it was a business track, let's say, as opposed a business or, or a Bachelor of Arts track, excuse me, as opposed to a Bachelor of Science track, I didn't take the necessary amount of mathematics and calculus and statistics to get into the graduate school. And if you're, you know, if our audience wants to learn something about graduate school and economics, it's that they would rather have um, a math major who knew nothing about economics than to have someone who knew economics but didn't know math. Mm. Um, Interesting. They would rather have that kind of student. So when I applied to graduate school, or should I say before I applied to graduate school, I went back to Washburn um, and I took uh, three, almost four years of advanced calculus and advanced statistics courses. Um, basically, I was like a, on a, on a pre-engineering track almost. Um, uh, I took those courses and then I had to apply to graduate school and then, and then I got accepted. Okay. And that was at KU. Is that right? That was at KU. That's right. Okay. So you were talking about what, when you went into the business program at Washburn as undergrad, you economics came easy to you, but what, what career did you think you were going to then pursue? Because, you know, people talk about economists, but what job did you think you were, you said not an accountant because, you know, you didn't, love accounting or, or, or math necessarily, what did you think the options were for you out of college? Oh, okay. That's a good question. So if I was going to, hmm, 
It depends. So let's say I would have just stuck with my graduate, or not my graduate, my undergrad degree in economics. I could do anything business related, right? Um, it, it's 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 no different than getting a bachelor, uh, you know, a bachelor of arts in management or, um, you know, in, in marketing. You know, you can just go into any particular business role. I could even go and get an MBA if I wanted to. Um, so that path was really open. A lot of places I could go. Going to graduate school in economics, um, that had a much more narrow path. Um, either, oh, can you hear me well, Chuck? I can. Okay, good. Um, that had a much narrow path. Uh, either I could go into academia and become a professor, um, or, or of course I could be a policy economist. And uh, a policy economist usually uh, is in government. Um, and in some aspects of, of the private sector, but um, it's much more narrow than an MBA. Um, and so, yeah, so those were, were my paths. And that was because I was going to graduate school in economics. I can only become a professor or, um, you know, do something government or government related. And at that time, did you know that you wanted to go more toward the government path than academia or what? At that point, when you entered graduate school, what were you thinking? Once I complete this, I, I want to do what? That's a good question too. So um, I had to make that decision because in graduate school, when you apply, you have to choose whether you're going to go get a master's or whether you're going to get a PhD, right? Um, and uh, a master's is roughly two years, three, a PhD can uh, be, you know, four to eight years. Um and, uh, and there's a third option, which is you go for your master's, get that. And then if you want to, you can get into the PhD program, but that could be even longer. So with those two paths, master's or PhD, if I did the PhD, I most likely am going to go on the, uh, the academia track. If I did the master's, then I could go into the private sector or the, or the public sector and work. Um, and so what well, we decided to do, and I say we, it's my, my, my wife and I, um, we decided what works best for us is to go for the master's and go for the policy economist track um, because, you know, we didn't necessarily, you know, teaching is teaching is obviously nice, but we didn't want to be in, in, in academia. We wanted to uh, um, uh, help folks and, and, and be more what we thought would be more practical um, and give ourselves a more wide ranging options in terms of career paths. Got it. Got it. So obviously you um, got your master's uh, from KU. And then what, I mean, were there any challenges along the way um, in, in getting that degree? Or, I mean, obviously just the challenge from getting from New York to Topeka, things kind of fell in place, but um, what, what were some of the, or were there, were there any obstacles that you had to overcome during those initial years as you were kind of moving along your path toward being an economist? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, just, just naturally the, the amount of mathematics that you have to do in the graduate program was obviously difficult. Um, uh, I don't know if I would, you know, call this, it's not an obstacle per se, because I was actually kind of empowered by it, but um you know, the fact that I'm going through a graduate program that's heavily in mathematics, there are a lot of foreign students, um, not a lot of Americans going through it. And, and even to a more narrow extent of the Americans, you know, um, I was the only African American uh, student going in there. And that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean a, a whole lot, but it's obviously something I noticed. And, you know, and so uh, I, I say that because it, it made me feel like, you know, um, I was kind of trailblazing. And so I needed to do my very best, uh, do my very best, not necessarily outcompete everyone, but, but, but come out of the program, you know, a respectable uh, graduate in my field. Um, and, you know, if someone, you know, sees me in the future and they know that I went to KU and, um, and, you know, maybe they're worried that they may not be able to do it because they don't see anybody else that looks like them, then, then maybe that means that they can do it too. Um, so it wasn't necessarily an obstacle, but it was a recognition 
that um, I should do what I can so that I can help inspire others follow the same path that I did. It's, it's interesting you say that because I know that recently, and, and I wanted to get into this a little bit later, but this is a, a good time. Um, the, the, the KU Black Alumni Network recently recognized you along with six others as emerging leaders. Uh, and this was, as I said, the, the first time this was done. And it looked like, um, you know, a, a diverse group of people as far as careers go and things like that. And, and I think you were recognized because of community involvement and leadership. But can you can you explain that a little bit more? Because I assume that was quite an honor to be the first group chosen or to be among that group. And, and can you tell us a little bit more about that and what it meant? Yeah. To you? The, the way that I understand it, so the, the Kansas Black Alumni Network, um, they have a recognition for, of course, um, you know, members of their alumni network, but it, it's usually those seasoned professionals. Um, um, and so they had started a new uh, recognition for, as they call it, an emerging leader. Um, and it's supposed to be, you know, a few uh, males, a few females uh, under 30 or at least around 30 who, of course, went to KU, made a measurable impact at KU and are poised to make an impact, you know, statewide. And so um, the dean of Washburn School of Business, um, Dean Sollers, he recommended me um, and nominated me for the uh, for that award. Um, and Obviously, he knew of me when I went to a business. At the same time, I, I sit on, you know, one of his advisory councils as he's looking to, you know, adapt the school of business for, you know, the new times. And so we had a really good relationship. And so he felt like he could nominate me for this award. And um, yeah, I was very lucky to, to, to be accepted for it. Um, you know, yes, it's the, the, the KU Black alumni, but I think it's really important to, um to put out there that it's, it doesn't have to be about African-Americans, right? It's, it, it's just about the fact that we're young professionals um, um, doing what we can and that we want to show that it doesn't matter what you look like, um, doesn't matter if you're a male or female, that you can achieve, you can achieve good things um, and you can make an impact in your community, in your state, in your country. Um, and to never be afraid, you know, and never be afraid that you can't do that. And so, what you've obviously contributed uh, in a in a measurable and recognizable way, probably while you're in school, but but certainly then after you got your master's degree, then you started to pursue a career in economics in the policy arena. Can you tell us how that happened? Because not just everyone can get a job, and I don't know if your first job was working for the governor, but um, can you tell us how you got that first job and and then what you were doing in that job and how it led to the next thing that you were doing. Sure. Well, um, one of my first private sector jobs was actually working at Best Buy, uh, selling cell phones. And depending on the day, I can think very fondly of my time uh, working at Best Buy compared to what I'm doing right now. So uh, I, I want to put that out there. Um, but after I got after I got my undergrad at Washburn, I applied for um, an internship in Kansas government, um, and this was in the governor's office. Um, it was under the director of appointments. Um, uh, actually, it was two. It, it, the internship was kind of split. One at one part of the time, I was working under the director of appointments under the governor, and then I also worked at the Kansas Department of Revenue. Um, and so, uh, yeah, they split the internship that way. And this was in 2012. Um, so that was kind of where I got my, my, my foot in the door and the director of appointments was kind of, a, uh, an econ nerd, uh, herself a little bit where she would ask me questions or she would present me articles that she saw online and, you know, we would have to have a discussion and I would have to put my, you know, undergrad econ skills to the test. And, um, after the internship was over, um, I was then placed at the Kansas department of labor as a research analyst. And, um, and this job was basically a big, um, a big gopher. Okay. So I would, I would either be at my computer or be by the phone and uh, constituents would call and they would say, Hey, I need 
unemployment rate for Wichita County in 2011, right? And I said, okay, well, let me get your email and phone number. And then I would have to, you know, figure that out and find that information and put it in an easy to read format um, and easy understandable. And then I would send it to that person. And I did that job for two years, um, basically just handling any type of constituent data gathering calls and presenting that information. And as tedious as it was, that's like the foundation of, of, of my work today where, um, you know, I present fact, I, I'll present facts and figures and analysis, but as to where I go to find that data, I go all the way back to, you know, my very first big boy job, you know, at the Kansas Department of Labor, knowing where I can find census records, where I can find jobs data, where I can find, you know, GDP and, and, uh, and, and wage data. Um, and that really helped make my job a lot easier. So when you're at Department of Labor, then ultimately you moved into the governor's office. Um, how did that happen? What, how did your role change? And then how did you use that to go on to the next thing? And then um, okay. did you have, and did you have at that time, did you have kind of the dream job in mind? Maybe it was the job you were doing. And, and so maybe that dream changed, but can you kind of tell us, what you were thinking at that time and what you were dreaming about and how the career has kind of progressed since then. You know, um, even when I wanted to be an attorney, um, I knew that what I wanted to do was consult. Um, I wanted to be, I didn't want to be the leader. I wanted to be the person next to the leader, helping them, you know, make the tough decisions uh, of, of the day and of the age. Um, and I thought I would, do that as an attorney. And when, you know, after I got my econ degree, I wanted to do that as an economist. Um, my next step in the role. So I did the department of labor thing. And then I decided to go to grad school at KU. And um, I wanted to find a job that I could work concurrently as I, as I got my master's degree. So um, I saw, I saw a fellowship at the Kansas Legislative Research Department, um, and I tried to apply for it. And in my application, I contacted the director of appointments that I was an intern at, and I'd said, hey, can you just make a nice reference letter for me for this fellowship? And the director of appointments said, I have a better idea. Why don't you come up and work for the governor? Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll help you out and we'll work out a schedule so that you can go to school at the same time. And, um, uh, uh, and that was a great opportunity. So I, I came up, I was a, an economic research fellow, uh, for, uh, for the governor. And I did that while concurrently getting my master's degree. And so that was what, 2014, roughly until 2016. Okay. Okay. And then you left the governor's office and tell us, tell us what you were doing then. And then I, I believe you have your own consulting firm, which was, it, it, I, I don't want to tell your story for you, I, but if you, if, if that's accurate, I, I'm just curious um, what you've done and how you've continued to kind of build on, on previous okay. jobs. And, and then I want to talk about what you're, what you're doing now a, a little bit as well. And then how all right, all so let me, uh, let me fast forward it, it, it a bit if I can. Yes. Sure. So uh, after I got the graduate degree, I went back to the department of labor as an, an actual economist. And then okay. I worked my way up to be chief. Um, uh, I left for a bit to go work in Kansas city, Missouri. I came back as chief. Um, and then I, uh, worked at the Kansas policy Institute, uh, as director of fiscal policy. Um, and then, um, I decided to, to leave the Kansas policy Institute during the uh, COVID pandemic, um, and make a run for a new office, um, uh, while also running my own economic consulting firm. And so that probably catches up up now. Okay. And so uh, you've done that. And, and uh, I mean, if people are involved in policy in Kansas, they've probably seen you, certainly economic policy and, and the Kansas Policy Institute is well known. Um, and so you've been pretty visible on a number of different issues. Um, and so um, 
now you're in maybe an even more public uh, position because you're running for public office. And, you know, I, I was involved in politics for most of my adult life. And, you know, one of the things that um, there, there are a few things you, you learn about politics in Kansas. Kansas is a small state, uh, relatively speaking. And sometimes primaries can be messy because you're running against people you know and, and like. Um, so it's not necessarily running against them, but running for a position. Um, but you're currently a candidate for state treasurer. And I'm curious why you decided to do that. And then what, what how has that changed your life? And kind of tell us uh, how that all came about and, and give us a kind of a feel for what life on the campaign trail is, is like. Sure. So, um, uh, so I have a little boy, Oliver, uh, he's six years old. And, um, you know, as a, as someone who's, you know, kind of traditionally or uh, not kind of, excuse me, I am traditionally conservative. You know, I understand that there are certain things that I should probably take on, you know, as, as a dad or as a parent. And one of those is, you know, the education of, uh, of my son. So, you know, when he was in pre-K, you know, um, even though he was going to pre-K, I was still, you know, instructing him at home and practicing his letters and his numbers uh, and, you know, learning, uh, teaching him how to write his name and um you know and we basically continued that and, and slowly ramped up his education as he went through the years and so when um the covid pandemic happened and we saw school shutdowns and things like that um uh he was not you know we were affected yes but um but when it came to, let's say, his education, as an example, even though he was on a screen um, and he was no longer in the classroom, he still was able to keep his education up to up to speed. And that was because, you know, the bulk of his education didn't come from the screen. It came from it, it came from his mom and his dad. Um, and while we were affected, um, I knew that ultimately it, it still it was still a blessing. Um, in other words, we were still privileged because we had taken steps before the pandemic even happened to make sure that he wasn't going to be disadvantaged. But I know that there are so many families out there that didn't have the same luxuries, didn't have the same privileges, may not have made the same choices. And so, you know, when the pandemic happened and, and the government, you know, um, did its response, many families felt like they were stuck or that they had no way out. Um, and I didn't feel like that was right. And so I, I decided to do something about it. And, and I decided to run for office and try to be the candidate I've always wanted to see in a race um, so that I can help families make sure that they don't have to go through this ever again. And so the election, of course, is uh, the primary is August 2022. Uh, and then when we make it past that, the, the, the general would be in November of next year. And so, you know, right now we're, we're, we're traveling across the state, kind of doing what we've always been doing, which is talking about the economic challenges that, that, that Kansans are facing. But this time we're providing solutions in the lens of a state treasurer. Um, and so, um, you know, we're talking about, you know, about uh, financial literacy. We're we're talking about educational freedom and choice. We're talking about, you know, um, things that we're hearing, you know, in the classroom. You know, I think there's something called critical race theory that's going on in schools. Um, and we're just trying to be there for parents. We're just trying to be there for stakeholders in this state. And we want to show them that a state treasurer can help in those things, especially if it's one, you know, that has the economic training to help with, you know, the latest challenges we're all experiencing. It's, it's interesting you you brought up critical race theory um, because there has been a lot of discussion about that and internally um, you know I've I've spoken with with some of our team about this issue because I don't I don't fully understand it um, and I've tried to educate myself on it by watching some videos I haven't probably read as much as I should um, and and so, you know, there are differing points of view on, on critical race theory. Uh, some people say, well, it's not really what, what you hear it is. And some people say it's worse than what you hear it is. So, you know, it seems like there are kind of these, these 
extreme views of what critical race theory is. And I'm sure somewhere in, in between is, is the truth. I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, what, what your thoughts are on it. And um, well, just, I'm, I'm curious what, what, what you know about it, because you've obviously studied it probably more than I have. Um, and then what it, what it means to our young people. Okay. Um, if I can, I'm going to do my best to give as layman's as, as of a definition as I can. And, you know, if we want to go a little bit deeper, we can go a little bit deeper. Um, but the ultimate output of critical race theory um, in, let's say, our K through 12 system, it, it implies a belief that because of our history, uh, because of American history, or maybe even because of global history, a child born today of a certain skin tone, right, has certain grievances against another child born on the same day, but with a different skin tone, right? Um, as an example, because of, let's say, uh, uh, slavery in this country um, almost uh, 150 years ago, right? Um, I should, you know, uh, or let's say you should treat me differently because of slavery happening 100 years ago. Now, how you should treat me differently, that can definitely be up to debate. Many people have different types of uh, thoughts about what that means. Um, but that's what critical race theory is unfortunately promoting. And I'm particularly not a fan of it. Um, what, I, what unfortunately doesn't sit well with me is, you know, Yes, history is tragic. History um, is not a fairy tale. When you learn things about the Holocaust or about history, or excuse me, about slavery, you're not supposed to feel happy. Um, you know, you're supposed to take those events and use them to ensure that we don't make the same mistakes again, right? But you have to draw a line, right, where it means that, you know, you, Chuck, for example, uh, of a lighter skin tone had nothing to do with that. Um, me being a darker skin tone, I had nothing tied to that, right? And so it should have no bearing on how we should treat each other because we should treat each other as human beings and, and, and by the content of our character. But um, what critical race theory does is that it assumes that there's some sort of power dynamic in this country. Um, and it's a power dynamic based off of the way that we look. Um, and, 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 you know, that type of power dynamic is not the founding of this country. It's not, that's not what we've been taught. It's not what, uh, that's not what great civil rights leaders have advocated for. Um, and I think if we're not careful, it could actually, you know, lead to us going backwards in society where, and that's someplace that we don't want to be as a country. And it's difficult for me as a white male to understand, you know, someone else's perspective what, what would be your advice for someone like me um, that, that doesn't fully understand some of, some of the issues? I'm trying to be sensitive to that, um, but I'm not sure the best thing for me to do because I, I really am a simple person and I kind of always fall back on the golden rule, treat people like you want to be treated and uh, and some people have told me that's not good enough. What is your best piece of advice in succeeding in what sometimes seems like a really divisive environment and, and culture in being successful uh, with all of, all of this, this stuff that's going on? That's a I big think, question. That's a really big question. It is a big question, but you already said the answer. Um, you said, you know, your, your first inclination, your, what you feel in your heart is that you should treat people as, as you would, you know, as you would want to be treated yourself. And, uh, you know, that is enough. Um, that is all that we can ask for. You, you, you know, you are right to a certain extent that you can't put yourself in someone's perspective, but it's not because you're a white man. It's just because you are Chuck Knapp, you know, and as Chuck Knapp, uh, you can't be somebody else. You can only be, you know, Chuck Knapp. It has nothing to do with, you know, with, with your skin color. Um, it just has to do with the choices and, and the perspectives that you have developed, you know, in your life. And that also means that 
me myself, I can't speak for African Americans. I can't speak for anyone that has the same skin color as me because I have gone through life making certain choices, right? That no one else on this planet has made, right? Um, no one else has made the exact same choices and decisions that I have made. And the same goes, same goes for you. So the only thing that we can do is have grace. Um, and so, you know, you being sensitive to, you know, what other people feel about certain topics, that doesn't mean you shouldn't talk about them. It just means that when you approach that subject, you know, uh, you know, you make sure that you communicate that you're coming and approaching to this person, you know, with kindness. And then the person who's the recipient of that, they should have grace as well to understand that, yes, you're coming with them to kindness because you want to learn, um, not because, you know, uh, you're, you're trying to be offensive in any way, shape or form. So it's a two way street. And on both sides, you need grace in order to have that understanding. And I think when we're talking about the divisive nature of our world today, I think it can stem back to the fact that, you know, in that conversation, at least one person isn't doesn't have the grace to understand that we're all human beings, right? And we are all fallible and we all make mistakes, but at least we're coming together uh, trying to have dialogue. You know, at least one side isn't recognizing that. And that's where we get this cancel culture or that's where we get this, you know, offensive term because throughout my entire life, I can, I can barely where, you know, someone let's say was being racially offensive to me. Um, and in fact, if anything, I'm pretty sure that happened more in New York City than it did in Kansas. Um, I can't think of anybody in Kansas. And how is that? How is that that an African American in a state, you know, um, in a state and city where it's predominantly uh, Caucasians, you know, can't think of any lick where he's been, you know, racially mistreated? And that's because Kansans, by and large, have a have a, a genuine respect for their fellow man and human being. While they acknowledge that we are all different, we are all you know, we're all flesh and blood, um, and we all want to be treated with kindness and respect. And so, I think it's a noble goal to have that as you're moving forward, as you're leading an organization. Um, those who are calling for something different, um, those who are calling for something different you know, unfortunately may not have that grace and that respect for human beings in mind. Well, you mentioned divisiveness. Uh, politics can certainly be divisive. Um, and, and I appreciate your thoughts on, on race and, and, and uh, critical race theory. Um, but now you're really in the political arena and, and it's very polarized. Um, one of the things, I don't know if you can hear the banging in the background, but they're putting in uh, flooring in our office. So I apologize for that. Um, politics is, is really polarizing. One of the, the things that we have really uh, benefited from is strong bipartisan support. Legislators, whether they're Democratic members or Republican members, have supported our mission, they've supported our organization. That goes for the governors. Uh, Governor Brownback, uh, Republican, brought JAG-K to the state in 2013. And Governor Kelly is uh, supportive, not only supportive, she sits on our national board of directors. So even the three governors we've had since we've been in existence have been very supportive of JAG-K. So we appreciate that, but that's not, it almost feels like the exception these days, but I also know that people focus on, on division and they don't see the other things that people agree on within the political realm. So my, my question is, um, what have, what can you do as a candidate to try to focus on the issues perhaps um, what have you experienced personally during this campaign and realizing that the election is next year? So you still got a long ways to go. You said the primary was in August of 2022, but you've already been out on the stump. What have you experienced on the stump? Was it what you thought it would be? How have you contributed to, uh, I guess, setting a, a tone where it's focused on issues and not personalities? Oh, that's, that's a really good point. Um, you know, I go back to why I'm running, um, which is so often, um, 
I would see a race and it would be candidate A and candidate, you know, B uh, running for this race. And then I would say to myself, oh, why couldn't there be somebody else? Right. Um, whether it was because they didn't have the proper policy or they didn't have the proper, you know, characters and, and, and ideals and principles that I believed in. Um, you know, there was never a character that I thought had a really good blend of both. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm running is because um, not only, of course, do I want to help, but I, I, I want to set the stage that, you know, I want to be that candidate that I would always want to see in that race. You know, if I could split myself into two and be both a candidate and sitting at home watching this candidate, you know, would I enthusiastically vote for this person? Um, and of course, you know, it's not going to be perfect. Of course, I'm going to make mistakes. But um, but what we're going to try to you know do is kind of be a happy warrior. Um, you know, we acknowledge that there are problems that need fixing, you know, in, in Kansas, uh, but how we do that matters just as much as, as the end goal itself. And so we want to come out, of course, being facts or having the facts, and we want to come out, you know, explaining the challenges that we're dealing with in a way that everybody can understand. And then kind of like our discussion with critical race theory, you know, we want to communicate with the understanding that, not everybody's knowledgeable um, and you have to come at it with grace and kindness and understanding and be, and, and be grateful, right. That you've had this opportunity. So we're going to do our best not to take anything for granted as we talk to people um, because every day is an opportunity. Every day is a blessing. And we want to show that, you know, in our campaign, um, you know, by, by being happy, by being optimistic, by being hopeful, um, and the most importantly, being a guide for the folks that need us. Yeah. What can you give us a little sample of uh, a day in the life of a candidate right now? OK, well, um, I might have to put on my non politician hat for a moment here, because when I start my day, um, it is making sure I get my kids up and ready to go to school. <laughs> <laughs> um, either I'm taking them or I'm at least getting them ready uh, so my wife can take them. Um, and then after that, um, I usually respond to emails, um, usually in the morning. Um, and so that usually takes an hour or so. And then uh, throughout the day, um, I'm making phone calls. Um, I'm, I'm talking to, to you know, potential voters. I'm talking to stakeholders. I'm setting up meetings during the day. Um, you know, just letting them know, of course, that we have a campaign up and going and, and, uh, you know, do you want a yard sign, you know, what, you know, what do you need from me in order to pledge support? Um, and then usually in the afternoon or evenings, I'm, I'm going out to some event to either do a public speech, um, or, you know, to, to, to make more introductions or things like that. Um, so that's, that's most of the days, um, and then maybe on a special occasion, you know, I may not do anything like a birthday or something like that. But um, but but no, that's it's 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 very busy. Um, it's very busy. And every day, you know, I, every hour I could be doing something to help make sure, you know, we get our message out that we're a different candidate, that, that we are a freedom focused candidate. Um, and we want to be something that you would be proud to support. The, the candidates I know, uh, I think there are four in the Republican primary. Uh, and then of the ones I know, I, I, I believe at least three of the four, well, I know three of the four support Jack K. Uh, I'm not sure about the fourth just because I don't know. And then, of course, uh, the current treasurer, Lynn Rogers, has been very supportive of Jack K. Uh, again, we appreciate that. He's certainly been talking about financial literacy and and those things that um, that are important to the treasurer's office and some of the services that that our students and their families have access to in the treasurer's office um, so we appreciate that uh, and certainly would hope that the that that would continue whether and whether it's treasurer rogers or you or another candidate um, are there any major changes you would want to see in any of those things if you were if you were the treasurer? Yes, 
So we're focused on three things. Um, one, which is educational freedom and school choice. Um, second would be financial literacy. And then the third would be finding ways that we can empower Kansans by keeping government limited and giving you the most opportunity possible. So on that first one, educational choice. Um, you know, this goes back to the whole experience of why I'm running, right? Which is, um, uh, which is the fact that I knew that there are so many families out there that didn't have the same opportunities that I did when, um, you know, uh, government decided to shut schools down to deal with the pandemic. So in the treasurer's office, there are things called 529s. Um, have you have you ever heard of them? Um, we, we have. And in fact, Treasurer Rogers has has spoken quite a bit about those with our students. So it's a great program, I, we think. Now, maybe you have a, yeah. an idea no, to make it better. I agree. Or... They, they are a great program. Um, for your audience, for those who don't know, these are like education savings accounts. You can put money aside. It kind of grows with the market. And then you can pull it out for um, education expenses. And now you can use it for K-12 through education. And so what we want to do is we want to encourage more families to have these type of accounts um, and make it much easier to, um, uh, to do state matching, right? So if a, a low-income family puts $100 in, there are certain rules in which uh, the state can match that $100. We want to relax those rules and make it easier and more rewarding for people to save their money. Because as an economist, um, I know that saving money is far more important than spending it, right? Because if you save your money, then you have an opportunity to spend even more in the future. Um, and if we think about it, if more families had these 529 accounts, then, you know, um, when schools shut down, that meant that they could, let's say, afford a tutor, right? Or they could have uh, had the money to relocate their kid from one public school to another public school. Uh, they would have had a lot more options to make sure that they kept the, the educational rigor up. Um, and so we want to make sure they have that opportunity. The second thing we want to promote, of course, is financial literacy. Um, and that is simply utilizing the relationships that the tre treasurer can have with financial institutions. Um, the treasurer is kind of known as the people's banker. Um, and so what we would love to be able to do is work school district by school district. We'll bring together financial institutions and school boards to see if they can find a way to increase the personal finance instruction of our young our young people out there. Um, and I don't need to tell you the value of, of financial literacy and personal finance, right? I mean, it's, it's uh, better financial decisions, hopefully better jobs, easier to get a home, easier to just in, improve your quality of life. The, the, the benefits are almost endless. And then the last and last but not least uh, policy we wanna promote is as I said, empowering Kansans by keeping government limited. And what that particularly means is in the state statute, the state treasurer can make recommendations to state agencies on their cash and their budget management practices. Um, in other words, uh, a state treasurer can, you know, acknowledge a challenge uh, that's happening, uh, you know, that's happening in Kansas and make a recommendation on what a state agency can do um, to fix that. Oh, can you see me well enough? Is this light bothering? See if I can fix this a little bit here. Just much better, go. but yes, we go. Yes. Um, a state treasurer can propose policies for state agencies uh, to implement, and that's really interesting because if you think about it, that's basically what an economist does, right? An economist sees the challenges, sees the problems, presents solutions, and then, of course, the legislature figures out how to get it passed. Um, and so, the state treasurer can effectively be, you know, kind of like a state economist or a state economic role if you get the right person in there. Um, so, you know, we can talk about, you know, how we can better optimize the budget so that, you know, we can help uh, young Kansans out there. How we can, you know, optimize the budget so that, you know, maybe there are fewer taxes taken out of your wallet so you can, you know, have a more rewarding experience at a job or, um, you know, or, or, or living in an area. We want to put our economic skills and knowledge and abilities kind of in that role to be a, a, an advocate of sorts. And that way we'll present policies that you can see that, that, uh, that Kansans and other stakeholders can see, and they can hold their government accountable and kind of help push us towards a good conservative or, or traditional principled outcome. Great, thanks. I'm sorry, I had to mute it because I don't know if you can hear in the background, they are, I don't know, tearing down a Sounds wall like you have a, yeah, sounds like you have a beehive going out there or something. 
<laughs> yes, yes. So uh, maybe we can edit that out. But um, what, you've been very generous with your time. If you had one last piece of advice for our students in pursuing their dreams, uh, becoming what they want to become, we we say here at, at JAGK that we don't define success for our students. We help them achieve it. And, and so I, I'm curious, what advice would you give our students as they pursue their idea of success? Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, just like history, your life, however that's going to turn out, is not going to be a smooth a smooth sail, right? It's not going to be easy going. Um, there are going to be bumps in your road. Maybe you'll have to take a sidestep on your journey. Maybe you'll even have to take a backtrack on your journey. But every opportunity, either you succeed or you learn. Um, and if you have that mindset, right, then you will achieve any goal that you can set your mind to. I, I truly believe it. Um, you know, those who, let's say, you know, may not make exactly, you know, may not make the, uh, uh, you know, their version of success, you know, either needs to, um, uh, you know, rethink about what success means, right, or take that they made and learn from them. Um, and if we can do that, then, uh, you know, nine times out of 10, you'll be happy and satisfied with where you are. So just don't look at your mistakes as a negative, look at them as an opportunity to grow. Um, you'll either win or you will learn. Well, Michael Austin, thank you for being generous with your time today. We appreciate hearing your story, um, your thoughts on some big issues. And uh, we will we will give other candidates for state treasurer an opportunity to to talk about their stories as well. But we've really enjoyed hearing yours and uh, wish you well on the campaign trail with balancing all of those things that you're balancing right now. And, um, you know, hopefully you can check in throughout this process and and uh, share share the journey with our students. Will do. Thank you so much for having me on, uh, Chuck. Uh, if, if this conversation helps anybody in, in terms of, you know, the obstacles that they're facing, um, then it's more than worth it. And, and I hope I get another opportunity to share and to help.